Well, this morning is going to be a great morning, so put your hands together like this. Yeah. I praise in the valley and praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure and praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm number and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the waters, my enemy drowning. Come on, let's shout this this morning. As long as I'm beating, I've got a reason to pray.
hope my words fall short. I've got nothing to lose. How could I experience all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do. Every song I stand and you never do. So I throw my hands and praise you again and again. Cause all that I have is to have. for a heart
get tired of singing of your greatness. Instead, we step into your presence. Just excited that anything is possible when we're close to you. Church, me right now, you just need to take a deep breath. And just breathe in and reflect on the goodness of God. Today, I'm holding that truth. I'm holding that hope. God, you are good. And so today, God, we, we don't come into your pres presence and take it casually. No, we come with expectant hearts, God, knowing that you can move things. You can change things. You can shift things. And so today, Lord, we fix our eyes on you. The God that is good, the God that is worthy. And we just say we love you, God. We love you, Lord. And it's in your mighty name we pray. Come on, and God's people said, amen, amen. Well, hey, turn to the neighbor next to you. Say, it's good to see you this morning. Glad you're in church. Give them a high five. Then you may be seated. Well, hey, good morning. Welcome to church. We're so glad you're here with us today, joining us at the bridge. And hey, before I say this next part, I just want to preface it by saying if you're someone that walks into the store right now and cannot believe that they have Christmas stuff up already, I'm going to need you to, to close your eyes and cover your ears because... Right now, I'm so excited to tell you, right around the corner is Christmas Store 2023. Come on. Those of you cheering, you know how good the Christmas Store is. And those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, what the Christmas Store is, is it's a way that we partner with families in our community to help them give the children, their children, a Christmas that they will enjoy and remember by making sure each kid gets something to wear, something to read, something they want, and something they need. And this year, I'm just, I'm expecting, I'm, I'm ready, anticipating the only God stories, the way he's going to show up in mighty ways, because we're, we're more ready than we have ever been. Just this week, I was in the hub on the third floor. I walked up and I came across this small group that has been meeting all year long, getting ready for the Christmas store. Every week they've been labeling things, sorting things, making sure they get these toys on, on good deals. And I was just like, yes, I love this. We're making room and space, being ready on our end so God can move in mighty ways. And the Christmas store is just this giant thing. I mean, it's it's so awesome. There's a thousand kids in a Tumwa area that are going to get shot for, and, and kids in Centerville, Fairfield, and Oskaloosa, they're going to get shot for too. And get this, this is mind-blowing. Christmas Store 2023, because of your generosity, because of your generosity towards Kingdom Builders, is already completely funded. I mean, come on, how amazing is that? So I just want to say thank you for being in on what God is doing in Southeast Iowa. We are ready, and I just believe that God in this next season has big things in store for the Bridge Church. And one more thing to tell you. In just two weeks, we are entering in one of our favorite series every year, I and mean, we get so excited for this. At the Movies is just two weeks away, and uh, today we have a sneak peek for you. Let's check it out. Church, how we doing? Let's welcome Cub. Let's go ahead and and just keep this as awkward as we can. Hey, could you do me a favor? Could you help me welcome in Centerville, Oskaloosa, Fairfield, those watching at home online? Talked to someone recently. They, they they watch every week on TV. I forgot we're on TV. That's so maybe you're there. Hello, we're a week behind. You should come. It's amazing. All right, so. Uh, today we have a, an amazing um, guest friend who's going to be sharing, and I, I, I want to give them as much time as I can, but I also want to just kind of clue you into something. There's, we are in a unique season where I believe the core value of we walk in bold faith is really being presented to us. 
are we serious? Will we, as a church, walk in bold faith? And so many of you, you know, November 12th, we've got Kingdom Builders offering, and we've been asking you, would you be prayerfully considering being a part of that? And so there's this element where faith and funding, they, they coincide, they connect. And I, I want that kind of to be present, but as I was pondering how to like invite you into this in a real way, it just hit me that actually more important than like trying to seek out more faith or, or like do we give more, I felt like the Lord said we are, we are supposed to fast as a church this week that there are things coming against us, that there are things in, that like somehow we're supposed to set apart a day to fast. And so if you've never done that before, maybe some of you, you're brand new to church and you're like, wait a minute, they're already asking me to quit. This is weird. This is, just hit pause on me and dial in in a moment. But for those of you who are like, no, 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 I, I want to know more. Here's what you can do. We got this wildly famous phone number. It's called 94,000. And if you text KB fast, all like one word, which really isn't a word because it would sound like kabust. And, and, but if you text 94,000, that word, we'll just say like, hey, so glad. And then tomorrow you'll get another text that invites you into what kind of fast you can do. And here's the day. We're going Tuesday, 7 a.m. to Wednesday morning, 7 a.m., 24 hours in one minute, technically, I guess. And, 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 and if you want in on that, what you do is you text 94,000, the word KB fast, and, and, and that will help us know who is praying. And, and, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying, to walk in bold faith, we need, we need the power of God. And this isn't so we can get more from God. I just know I need more of God in my life. And I believe we're coming up in some opposition as we take a bold step. I believe God's moving in, in Southeast Iowa like never before. I really do believe that. And so it requires, I believe, us to like seek the Lord fervently and, and, and hear from him. So if you've never fasted before and you want to know how to do that, or you want to, you want to jump in, 94,000, text the word KB fast. All right. Uh, this past summer, I was talking to a friend who introduced me to another friend. And I knew the other friend, and the other friend kind of knew me, but like, so a friend of a friend introduced me to another friend of theirs. So I have a friend who introduced me to a friend who introduced me to today's speaker. That's how this, this people are like, where'd you meet this guy? I'm like, well, a friend of a friend of a friend, you know, kind of thing. But we have become friends, and what we found out over the last four months is that we grew up in the same city in Minnesota, Bloomington, Minnesota. We hung out at the Dred Scott Fields probably together and didn't even realize it. He hails from Minnesota. He won't make any jokes about anything about yesterday's. No, no, jo no jokes about the football game. Seriously, wow, that... Thought that'd play a little better. All right, I apologize. But could you help me welcome my new friend, our new friend, Joe Anderson. Thanks, Thank you. I love you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Marty. It's so good to be here. I love your pastor. I love his family. I love your church. You're, God's doing something amazing here. I just want you to know that I think you realize that. And uh, I am honored to be able to be with you today and just share a little bit of what God has done in my life. And I want to jump right into it and introduce um, a picture of my wife and I when we got married 27 years ago this upcoming Thursday. October 26th is our 27th wedding anniversary. Yeah, and that's... Uh, when, when, I, when I look at this picture that was taken right before our wedding, we got married in uh, Milford, Michigan, and uh, it's always weird when you, you know, do the pre-wedding pictures and all that, but if you're like me, and I know many of you are, is when I look through pictures, I'll pause and I'll get a little distracted because I'll be like, what year was this? What was I thinking at that moment? Oh, I didn't know what was going to happen right after that picture. Had I known then what I would know that it would change everything. And I'm always very like sentimental and reflective of that moment, what I knew, what I didn't know, and what was going to come later. And so when I look at this picture, it was right before our wedding, I imagine, and you can imagine with me, what if a prophet from God, somebody who was basically speaking the word of God directly, who has 100% accuracy, came up to me, right at the time of this picture, right before my, my wedding ceremony, and he was going to tell me everything that was going to happen in my life over the next 27 years. Okay, so it, no, all these things I'm going to say are absolutely true. I didn't have a prophet, but you got to play along with me. If you would have come up to me and said, Joe, you're about to get married, 
And later tonight, actually in the middle of the night, there's going to be an intruder who's going to break into your in-law's home. Your father-in-law is a pastor. He's officiating your wedding. But this man's going to break into their house and is going to shoot him in bed with a 12-gauge slug. And it's just going to be an attempted murder on your wedding night. And instead of going on your honeymoon, you will be spending the next 10 days sleeping on the hospital waiting room floor, not knowing if that attempted murder is going to come back or not because the police aren't going to catch him. It's 1996, so people don't really know what PTSD is. It hasn't really been defined. But you and your wife are going to be suffering from it, and it's going to be a tragic event. And you're going to be set to move back to the Twin Cities, but your wife is not going to want to go because she's going to want to stay with her family, but reluctantly, she's going to go back with you. And behind the scenes, when you get back to your apartment, where you're doing an internship at a church, you're about to get credentialed to be a minister, you're going to be going on staff at this church, your your marriage is going to be hellish. Because you're going to be fighting, you're going to be arguing, your wife's going to be in a deep depression, she's going to want to be back in Michigan with her family, and it's going to be revealed that you are a closet alcoholic, and you're going to be turning to alcohol and hiding that, and deceiving her, deceiving yourself, deceiving the church that you're about to work at. Six months into your marriage, when you've been hiding all these things behind the surface, everything's going to come out in one moment. And your wife is going to leave you and go back to Michigan. You're going to lose your credentials that you just received as a minister the month before. You're going to have to turn those in. Your world is going to fall apart. You're going to be filled with shame and embarrassment. And instead of turning to God when all this help is going to be offered to you, you're going to turn your back to God. It's going to be the most unthinkable thing that you ever do. You can't even imagine the darkness and the places that you're going to go. You're going to go down a spiral, a a depressive uh, stream that's going to pull you deeper and deeper and darker and darker. And you're going to go into those places of alcoholism and addiction and being angry at God and blaming him for everything in your life, even your own decisions. And what was supposed to just be a short-term separation from your wife is going to turn into two years and ten months that you're separated. And during that time, you're going to be so severely alcoholic that you will wake up every morning with the first thought on your mind of suicide. And you'll get to a point where you know you're either going to go through with killing yourself or drink yourself to death or somehow get help. And you'll refuse to get any help that is Christ-centered or biblically based. You don't want to go to Teen Challenge. You don't want have anything to do with God. And you'll get an opportunity to go to Hazelden Treatment Facility, which is supposed to be the best medical treatment facility in the world. And you'll go there thinking they're going to fix you. You're going to think, they can give me a pill. They can give me a lobotomy. Give me shock therapy. Do whatever you can do to fix me. And while you're there, you're going to realize that the only hope you have is found in Jesus Christ. They can't medically fix you. There's nothing they can do for you apart from what Jesus can do. And on April 17th, 1999, you will surrender your life to Jesus and you'll never take a drink again. And you'll come out of that in a year after being sober, God will miraculously, against all odds, he will restore your relationship with your wife. After just a a tragic beginning to your marriage and then a two-year, ten-month separation, God will bring your wife back and you will get back together and it'll feel like you don't really know each other, you don't really like each other, you don't love each other, but God will breathe life into your marriage and you'll fall madly in love with one another. And you'll work on getting your credentials back as a minister. You'll be serving at a church. Things will be going well and a year into your marriage being restored, you'll want to start a family because your wife's dream was always to be a mom. And she'll get pregnant, and you'll be so excited, you'll be planning, you'll get the nursery ready, and then, horrifically, she will have a miscarriage. It'll hurt so bad. And you'll think, how could this happen? And you'll try again and have a second miscarriage, you'll try again and have a third miscarriage. And after that third miscarriage, you'll think, are we cursed? How could this be? And then, God will redeem that like he's been redeeming everything in your life, and he'll take you and lead you to adopt. And you will go and you'll start the process at an orientation and you'll set a record in the state of Minnesota how fast the adoption goes because six weeks after going to the orientation, you'll fly to North Carolina to pick up your baby girl and bring her home on Mother's Day 2003. And then a year later, you'll feel the call again to adopt. And this time it'll go even faster. It'll be three weeks from beginning to end. And you'll fly back down to North Carolina and pick up your baby boy and bring him home on Father's Day 2004. And then right after that, your wife will start feeling sick in the morning, especially. 
and you realize something special has happened, even though there'll be fear and apprehension because of what's happened in the past, everything's going to go perfectly. She'll give birth to your baby girl, and you will go from having zero children to having three kids in 23 months. <laughs> and you'll be in full-time ministry, and you'll be living the dream for both you and your wife. And 10 years into that, while you're a lead pastor, you'll feel called to adopt again. And this time, you'll, you'll be led to adopt twin baby boys from Haiti in an orphanage who were born right after the earthquake there. And this process is going to go extremely long. It'll take almost three years to finally be able to bring them home. You'll bring them home as three-year-olds, and it'll become apparent right away that one of them has severe trauma in his life. In fact, he'll be diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, which means that he is fighting against the care and the love, especially with your wife and with his mom, and that there, he'll, it'll be exhibited with a fascination with fire, with blood, with gore, with, with murder, with, with everything that's like the devil's to-do list, and he will be exhibiting just demonic oppression in his life like you have never seen or experienced. It will blow your mind. You didn't think this could possibly exist. You'll throw everything at this problem to try and get him freedom. You'll go to every psychologist, every deliverance ministry, every, you'll, you'll hit it from every angle possible. And after over two years of trying everything, it will get so bad that you will, be, you will be forced into a decision that will go against everything within your being. Everything within your DNA as a dad, as a husband, as a father, as an advocate for adoption, as, as a pastor, as a man of God. And you will have to relinquish your parental rights to him. It'll be heartbreaking. It'll scar you for life. But even in that pain, in that confusion, and asking why, God will still redeem that and use it for good. And as you're working through that as a family and in ministry, God will continue to redeem all these things you've gone through. And he'll lead you to, to move from Minnesota to Florida, and you'll be there, and you'll go through like the latest chapter of redemption in your life, and you'll come back in the year 2023 in the fall to the church in Iowa called The Bridge, and you'll share with the good people of The Bridge how God can redeem their lives as well. Can I remember that was all a prophecy, okay? That's a long prophecy, isn't it? Okay, and if that was being told to me, the young Joe Anderson right there, halfway through, I would have run out of the church and never come back. I would have. I was like, I'm not signing up for this. There's, that's too much pain. I, I can't possibly comprehend going through that. Aren't you thankful that God doesn't show you and hasn't shown you every bad thing that you would go through in life? Because we would just focus on the negative. We wouldn't think about how that could possibly be turned around for good, how he could change it, how he could use that in our lives. And thankfully, he doesn't show us that and that we can trust him every day and every time we go through something. The, I want to show you a picture of my family now and how when I look at my family, I see how God has redeemed He's taken what was meant for evil and turned it and used it for good. Even my own mistakes and bad decisions and things that have happened to us, Jesus redeems. God always redeems. He's in the business of redeeming our lives and what we go through. So this is me. It's Joe. My wife is Jen. Our oldest daughter, Jojo, who is 20. She has severe autism, and she's like at a nine-year-old um, intellectual level. She'll live with us the rest of our lives. She's an overcomer. She's going through all the things with her disability, and she's an amazing person. Our son, Joey, he's a sophomore in college. My daughter, Jada, she's a freshman in college. And then our youngest, Johnny, he's 13 years old. So we're Joe, Jen, Jojo, Joey, Jada, Johnny, and then our two dogs, Jeffrey and Gemma. <laughs> and, and at the center of it all is Jesus. He's there. And and people always you know, would make fun of us because we'd go with the J names and, like, the Joes and everything. And, I'm like, well, once you start with that, you can't name one of your kids Larry. You know, they'll get a complex. <laughs> but God redeems. And a verse that, that is a, a key point in redemption is Psalm 107, verses 1 through 3, which you're probably familiar with because these words are used in a song and it's lyrics. And we can easily, like, remember those words and forget the true meaning behind it. Because it says... Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And just let that point sink in right now. Because that is, if you're going to take anything away from what I'm sharing with you today, it's that simple message that is so hard to accept at times, that God is good. Because if, I, if we put out a test on paper and it was a true or false test, is God good? I believe most people here would check true, God is good. But if we really looked into our hearts, and said, do you really believe that with what you're going through right now? Many of us would probably reveal that we're struggling with a feeling that God has abandoned us. 
or he's not hearing our prayers, or that he's somehow tricking us, or playing with us, or punking us. We can go through that because we're like, why God? Why am I facing this? But the, the honest truth that we need to stand upon and the confidence in God's word is that he is good. He's nothing but good. It's impossible for him to be anything but good. There's no badness in him. There's no evil in him. God is good. His ways are so much higher than ours. We don't understand that, but he is absolutely positively good, and his love endures forever. It's not just a part-time love. It's not a temporary love. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. That's for any of us who've been saved and set free by Jesus. We've been taken from darkness to light from death to life, he makes us new. He turns all the things in our, our lives around for our good and for God's glory. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. That's what, that's what I'm doing with you today. And I want to share, um, I, I wrote a book with all those things I listed off at the beginning. Um, finally put that into a book just this past summer. And it's written in a way that I would like, if I was sitting having a cup of coffee with you and just going to share my testimony it's a quick read. It's very like meaningful. Uh, it's touched a lot of people's lives, and it goes into detail with all of those issues that we've gone through in my family. And this is available at the next steps um, table at all the locations, and you can check that out. And I encourage you to get that for yourself or for a friend. But the, one of the last chapters in there is the most recent thing that me and my family went through that we've seen God redeem. And I want to share that with you. It was um, in the, the winter of 2020, we had been serving at a, as a lead pastor at a church in St. Paul, Minnesota. Had great ministry there. My family was um, deeply entrenched in our community, lived in Minnesota our whole lives. Uh, my kids grew up with all their friends, all their athletics. Everything was, you know, my three oldest are in high school. Everything's going great for them. And we started feeling a geographic calling to move to Florida, right in the, the winter of 2020. And I know everyone in the Midwest feels a calling to move to Florida in the middle of the winter, like, here I am, Lord, send me, you know, I'll go, I answer the call. But it was more than that. It was like what I, I imagine a missionary feels when they're called to a, a nation or a region. It was just something I couldn't explain. And we moved right into the summer of COVID. It was a terrible time to even think about, think about moving. It was a terrible time to move my family with teenagers and just the ages they were at. But God opened a door for a position uh, for us to move to in a church in Fort Myers, Florida. And it was as if there were green lights on a road from the Twin Cities all the way to Fort Myers, where it was clearly where God was calling us. And so we moved there in October of 2020 and started this new position, and I quickly started seeing that those green lights turned to yellow lights and then turned to red lights, and it was not at all what I expected. And it was a terrible fit for my family and kids and for me. And after trying everything to make it work, I realized that there was not a path forward. And after a year of being there, I realized that the only option for me was to resign. And it took even more faith for me to resign as it did to move there. And it was a very difficult time. I resigned on Thanksgiving of 2021. And now my kids are on a year into high school there. They got new sports teams. Um, I don't have a backup plan. I don't have another job lined up. I don't have money saved up. I didn't have the 6 to 12 month emergency fund. Sorry, Dave Ramsey. I didn't do it. I didn't have it. And I'm thinking, okay, God, you're going to take care of us. You'll never leave us or forsake us or abandon us. And I clearly know you called us here. I don't know why. And I know you're calling us away and you'll take care of us. But I didn't hear an answer from God. And over those next two weeks, I was praying and I was seeking and I was thinking, what are we going to do? And my kids were at the ages where they're very aware of just financial things. And they're asking me questions like, hey, Dad, are we going to have Christmas presents this year? Hey, Dad, are we going to have to move back to Minnesota? Hey, Dad, are you going to still be able to help me get a car and get my license? And behind the scenes, I'm praying to my Heavenly Father saying, hey, Dad, I got to pay my mortgage. Hey, Dad, what are we doing here? Hey, Dad, can you give me some kind of direction? Hey, Dad, w what's happening here? And I wasn't hearing an answer. And I was stressed out. I was, I was getting depressed. I didn't know what to do. And I was really struggling with it. I was taking on. I wasn't handling it well. And two weeks into this, it was December 14th, which was a day that would forever change my life. I had been up all night, didn't sleep a wink. I was just wrestling with God and, and really just dealing with anxiety. And I was fasting. I didn't sleep. I didn't eat. 
And I was ornery that morning, and I knew that if I stayed around the house, I'd probably get in an argument with my wife. So I thought, I'm just going to go to the gym and get a workout in, and if, if I'm going to be unemployed, I might as well try and get jacked, you know, do something productive. <laughs> and because I was tired, I drank a big bottle of pre-workout energy drink. They just packed with caffeine, creatine, some kind of like illegal African root that makes your skin tingle, you know what I'm talking about? And, um, you know, there's, it, because I'm a recovery guy, we like acronyms and everything, and there, in, in AA and recovery, there's an acronym called HALT, H-A-L-T, and it's never let yourself get hungry, angry, lonely, and tired at the same time, because you'll make bad decisions. Well, I was four for four, and I made a bad decision to go to the gym, even on empty stomach, no sleep, and with all this caffeine in me. I go to the gym, and while I'm there, I start feeling um, this really weird, like almost out-of-body experience, really dreamy. And um, I knew something was wrong. And I just internally, I was just like, I got to go home. I got to get home. I got to get home right now. And so I left the gym, and I, I don't remember anything after I walked out the door. I was like blacked out. And I got into our Honda Odyssey minivan, like one of the safest vehicles around. And I pulled out of the parking lot and went to a stop sign. And there's security camera footage that shows all this. And I stopped at the stop sign for like a minute, which is a, a long time. And then I started having a stress-induced seizure. I've never had a seizure before or since. Um, and it caused me to jam my right foot into the gas pedal. And I went flying through the intersection into a parking lot, hit a curb, went airborne, head-on collision into a tree, and then went sideways into a building that was a home health care center filled with nurses. And they thought a bomb had gone off. And they ran out, and the van was smoking, and they had a fire extinguisher, and they could look in, and I was still convulsing and having a seizure. And they called 911, and fortunately, a, a, the fire department got there right away, and they used the jaws of life to cut open the door, put a neck brace on me, a backboard. They got me in the ambulance, and they're rushing me to the hospital. I wake up in the ambulance, and I don't have any idea of what happened. I don't even remember getting in a car. And when I opened my eyes and looked, my first thought was, that I'd been abducted. I thought I'd been kidnapped. I really did. And um, I mean, I've seen Jack Reacher, The Terminal List, Jason Bourne. I knew this day was coming. I've been waiting for this, you know. There's a saying that just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people are not out to get you, okay? And uh, they're like, I'm, I'm trying to punch them, and they're like, settle down. You've been hurt really bad. You were in a car accident. I'm like, car accident? Like, it, it just didn't make sense. And then the pain started to sink in. And I just felt excruciating pain going down my body. And I looked down, and one of the paramedics was holding my leg up, and my, my right foot was completely turned inside, um, dislocated, because I was pressing so hard on the gas pedal that it dislocated on impact. And I was just pleading with him to put it back in joint. I'm like, please put it back in joint. It hurts so bad. And he said, I can't do it. Only doctors can do that. I'm like, I'm begging you. Please just try. And he finally looked at one of the other paramedics. He gave him a nod. And then he took my foot and did like a little judo move and popped it back in the joint, and I passed out. And I wake up again as they're wheeling me into the ER, into the emergency room. And if, I don't know if you've ever gone through an experience like that. It's really weird. Um, they're all like working on me, and they're hooking things up to me, and they're starting to cut my shirt off. And this sounds like really trite and petty, but when the nurse came with the scissors, I, I told her, I said, hey, these are brand new Lululemon shorts. Like, I, they're expensive, and I really liked them. I'm like, please don't. I can take them off. She's like, buddy, you got way bigger problems than Lululemon. She's like, trust me, you are messed up. And uh, so I cut off all my clothes. He put me through the scans and everything. And here's a picture of the, of the van. I think we've got that. Um, and so, like, when my wife went the next day to get some of my things out of the van, the guy at the junkyard or whatever said, I'm sorry for your loss, because it was just, he thought that I was killed in it. And um, and there's a picture of me when I got to the hospital um, where I'm pretty messed up. They, they're, they're checking me out, and uh, they did all the scans, and the doctor came in to kind of give me the results. And he's like, it's really bad. He's like, your foot was dislocated, broken in two places. Two of your ribs are broken. Your liver and kidney numbers are way out of whack. Um, you broke your neck in two places. Um, you're, in fact, they, they didn't know this at the time. Um, they found this out later. But, you know, I was holding onto the steering wheel so hard in the middle of the seizure. This is super rare, but it tore my pec muscle off my breastplate. So my lower pec bilateral tear completely, the muscle like retracted. It was that much force with me holding that. And, um, and then he said, and now your spine. 
He goes, it's bad. And he didn't believe that I could feel my legs. He was poking me with like a metal poker. Can you feel this? Can you feel this? I'm like, yep. And he had a nurse hold a, a towel in front of my face so I couldn't cheat. And he's like, wow, I, I'm surprised you still have feeling. He said, three of your lower vertebrae have exploded. Uh, Twelve others have been cracked. And he goes, it's really bad. And he put his hand on my shoulder. And he, goes, he goes, I can't help you. Which like, you want your doctor to have a certain level of confidence that I would even say reaches to the level of arrogance just to make you feel good. And um, it's like, this is my Top Gun moment. You know, I need like a fighter pilot kind of mentality. And I get rooster when I need maverick, right? <laughs> and he says, there's another surgeon in town I'm going to try and get in t- contact with. And he does this innovative approach and he might be able to help you. So like two hours later, this new surgeon comes in and he, um, he's like full of confidence and everything. But he's like, let me be honest with you, it's bad. Your, your back's really bad. He goes, but we're going to do our best and we're going to take you into surgery tomorrow. He goes, but before... I leave. He goes, I want to get to know you as a person. He pulls up a chair and he goes, I just want you to tell me your story, which is the wrong thing to say to me. And I like, for the next hour, I am telling him everything that Jesus has done in my life, everything we've been through. He's restored my marriage and I'm sober and my kids and and I'm crying and he's crying. He's a Jewish doctor. He's not a believer. And he's like, I'm going to do my very best for you. I'm really inspired by this. So the next day I go into surgery and uh, it ended up being way more complicated than they thought and anticipated. And when I woke up, it was a 16-hour surgery. And uh, my surgeon, he was, when he first talked to me, he was giddy. He was so excited. And he's showing me the x-ray. And there's an x-ray of my back. Um, this is right after the surgery. Um, you can see, like, this is the white parts. That's all metal that's permanently in my back. There's four rods with 24 screws through 12 of my vertebrae from like my pelvic area up to um, my shoulder blades. And so he showed this to me and he's like, this is the most extensive back surgery I've ever done. I've been sending these x-rays all around my, the country to my colleagues. I and mean, I think his mom has this on her refrigerator. <laughs> and he's, he's like super excited and I could tell he was just pumped up and I, I wanted to, to give glory to God in that moment. And I said, doctor, it's, um, you know, I believe in the power of prayer and there are thousands of people praying specifically for you as my surgeon during that time. And he, again, remember, he's not a believer. And he, he paused, he goes, he goes, I gotta tell you, I could feel something in the middle of your surgery. He goes, in fact, when we were gonna put the metal bars in your back, he goes, we almost always use titanium. He goes, but I just felt like, like something was gonna be different with your life. And he goes, so I asked them to get me the cobalt bars because they're stronger and they last longer. And he said, I said, this man's going to live a long and active life. And I thought, how cool is it that through the power of prayer, the Holy Spirit can inspire a surgeon to speak life over me in the middle of a 16-hour surgery? And I felt that. He felt that. And it was an experience that I'll never forget. And I was going to have a long recovery. I mean, I had a, a back brace on. I have a, a neck brace where they're, in a couple weeks they were going to do neck surgery on me. And I'm recovering in the hospital. And I'm seeing God work through that. You know, there's a verse, Romans 8, 28, that is a famous verse. It's probably the second most famous verse in the Bible that is quoted often to people when they're going through trouble. It's, it's easy to say this to someone else. It's really hard to receive this. And it, it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I think the problem is that When we're going through a problem, we kind of say to God, like, hey, God, I think you and I have a different opinion of what good is, because how can this be good? And that's what I was feeling and struggling with the morning before my accident. But then strangely, miraculously, you'd think that I would feel worse after breaking my back and being incapacitated. But instead, I felt so loved by God. I felt so safe in his hand. I felt like everything was going to be okay. And I didn't, it wasn't an experience, in a near-death experience, where I was just saying, ooh, thank you for sparing me, God. Dodged a bullet. I was so confident in that moment that I didn't have any fear of death. That I was okay with going to heaven. In fact, I wanted to go to heaven. I don't want to leave my family, but I was like, I am saved. There's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. And I experienced that he could even turn this into good, even though my situation got just remarkably worse than it was earlier that day. And I saw God work 
day in, day out while I was in the hospital. I had so many opportunities to minister to the nurses, the doctors, and we saw over 100 people come and visit us, and that was a testimony to the, the, the hospital workers. And, you know, again, I'm still unemployed. I got all these mounting hospital bills while I'm there. No unemployment, no disability, anything like that. And people were just sending us money like crazy. I've never seen anything like, like this. Every day we'd open up cards and envelopes, and people were sending us money, and it was like, God, what, what, what's going on? And it, it was such a miracle because my biggest concern was, God, don't let my kids turn away from you because of this. Don't let them feel like you hung us out to dry. And they were able to see firsthand the love of the body of Christ come together and to support us at that time. And while I was in the hospital, I became good friends with a physician assistant who ran the floor. He was very outspoken, very smart, super respected, and, um, and, and he was a strong believer, and he was a, an Air Force veteran. I was an Air Force veteran, so we had that camaraderie. And every morning, he'd come into my room with a cup of coffee, and we'd talk for like 15 minutes. And I was getting scheduled to go in for my next surgery, and my surgeon told me, what we're going to do is we're going to cut open your throat, pull everything to the side, and then go in and put a metal plate with six screws uh, through three of your discs. And I'm like, that sounds like a terrible approach. You know, like, if you, don't you go through the back? He's like, no, it's better this way. I'm like, I, I, okay, you're the expert. I go, has this been done before? He's like, yeah, it's all the time. And uh, he said, the one risk is your vocal cords. And for whatever reason, that created fear in me. And I shared that with uh, the physician assistant. He kind of just filed that away. And the day of my surgery, the orderlies are pushing me in the bed down to um, the end of the hallway. And the, and the physician assistant, he's at the other end of the hallway. He yells at them to stop. And he runs down and um, he says, I got to pray for my brother before he goes into surgery because I know he's nervous about this. And you know, all the people around, they're not believers. They don't know what to do with their hands during prayer. They're like, okay, you know. Well, he, he lays his hands on my chest and he starts to pray a powerful, loud prayer just calling down fire, pleading the blood of Jesus. By his stripes, he's healed. He's like, touch my brother. Don't let him feel any anxiety. Just lift that fear off him in the name of Jesus. And then he doubles down and starts praying a very spirit-filled Pentecostal prayer out loud, which a lot of times that can be really awkward. But when you're going to get your throat cut open and pulled to the side, I was like, go, go, bring it, you know? Because you don't want like the, now we lay me down to sleep. If it's your will, you know, whatever, God, you know. No, if, if like... It was a little lesson. If someone asks you to pray for him, pray for him. And so I felt immediate like release of any fear, any anxiety. And I was just like, I was ready to go. And I went through that surgery and came out and everything went great. And I spent the next several days in the hospital. And I was supposed to go to a rehab clinic to learn how to walk and just start rehabbing. But I got COVID right before then. And they were going to quarantine me. And I begged them to release me. I'm like, if you quarantine my room, it's going to kill me. I need to be around people. And um, it was miraculous, but they signed off on the paper to release me from the hospital with COVID. I mean, it's Florida, y'all, okay? Like, they, they, they let me go. Um, and they sent me home, and I didn't really think this through, but there was a team of nurses that were having to take care of me. And when I got home, that team of nurses became my wife. And she is the most loving, caring person. She showed me the love of God by taking care of me. I mean, she needed to bathe me, wipe me, feed me, manage my meds. She had to do everything for me. I was like a big baby having to be taken care of. And um, I just saw the love of God be displayed through what she did and how much work that was. And it made me think about maybe you, if you are in the process of caring for someone, or you've done that, or you will in the future, you'll have the opportunity for a loved one, a family member. It's one of the most thankless things you'll ever do. It's not publicized. You're not celebrated for it, but God sees it. And I'd say it is probably the most Christian thing you can do. The most Christ-like thing you can do is to care for another like that. And my wife did that just tirelessly day in, day out. I mean, there's one day I think she wanted to hurt me because um, I was a lot. I'm, I'm a lot. I'm, I'm very high maintenance. And um, she, you know, when she'd shower me, it was like she had her sweatshirt, she'd get all wet and sweaty, and then she'd put my clothes on, and she was putting my clothes on, and my socks, I'm super particular about my socks. Like, I like them pulled up really tight, no wrinkles, it drives me nuts. And she was putting them on, and um, I looked down, and there were some wrinkles on my sock. 
And I just started pointing at my foot. And she looked at me and was like, what? And I go, you can do better than that. <laughs> I know, I know, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and she looked up at me and she's like, have you seen the movie Misery? You know, and I'm like, Jesus forgive me. And I'm like, the way you do socks is great. And uh, but I just saw God day in, day out begin to heal my body as I trusted him. And one of the things that was really important, I was on a ton of painkillers. And I knew as, a, as an addict, as an alcoholic, there was never going to be a day where I was going to say, yeah, I don't need any more of these. I'm good. I just know that. That's not going to happen with me. And so I made a decision to cut myself off from the painkillers way sooner than I probably should have, probably two months before I should have, which meant there were some long, dark, painful nights. And it was during those times that I sought the Lord and I really had some moments with him where he spoke to me and he, he taught me so much through that painful experience. And one night, in the middle of the night, he showed me this because I was just like, God, how can I, Romans 8, 28 and, and redemption and you taking things from bad and using it for good, how can that be like distilled where I can just remember this, I can share this with others? And he gave me this, I wrote this in my journal, this simple formula, the simple equation that is just this. It's sovereignty that God is all good. He's all powerful. He's in control. There's nothing beyond his view or his reach that he is sovereign, plus our surrender, our unconditional surrender and not compartmentalizing our life, but giving everything to him, saying your ways are greater than mine. I can't understand the way you understand, God. I trust you. Even though this doesn't make sense, even though this doesn't seem good, I trust you and I surrender to you. And when we do that, God's promise is that he will always redeem. He brings redemption. This is how we are saved and, and changed and made new for eternity. It's also how he'll take any situation in our life and turn it around for our good and for his glory. And I, as I meditate on that, I looked at it more, I realized, you know what? It's not so much a plus mark in the middle. It's more representative of the cross that Jesus died on. That he really completed both ends of this equation for us, that he's fully God, but he surrendered and gave his life so that we can have forgiveness of sins and that we can have new life and that we can be redeemed. I saw God work this through my life and in my family and the healing in my body. I mean, at the one year mark, I went and visited uh, my doctor for the checkup and every time I'd go in for checkups, he would call me the miracle man because I shouldn't have been able to walk and everything. There's actually a picture of me seeing the doctor at the one year mark, I think. Um, there we are and he was like, Every time when he called me Miracle Man, I think he regretted it because I would start telling him about the miracle worker and sharing with him about Jesus and what he's done in my life. And I made a much greater recovery than I should have. Thanks be to God and that he redeems. And there's a verse that's very near and dear to my family of how Jesus has made a way for us. And it's Galatians 3.13. It says this, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law because I felt at times that I was cursed. You maybe feel the same way. But we can know this. We can have confidence in God's word that Jesus redeemed us from the curse by becoming a curse for us. He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. For it is written, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. When Jesus went to the cross and he died for us, he broke the curse in our lives if we surrendered to him. And he makes all things new. And he turns what was meant for evil and uses it for good, for our good and for his glory. I want to close with this. That when I think about all the different moments in my life and the things that we've gone through as a family, there's one moment that stands out um, greater than all the rest that I believe was such a, a pivotal place that I would not be standing here if it wasn't for this moment. I know my family, my marriage, nothing would have survived. And it was after our third miscarriage. We really felt like we were cursed. We really felt like, why? You know, we went through a, a tragic event with her father-in-law, with my father-in-law on our wedding night and an attempted murder and separation, alcoholism, and we just want to have babies. And, and it was after that third miscarriage, we, we were so um, broken. And that next Sunday, we didn't want to go to church. We didn't want to see people. We didn't want to cry in front of people. And it was before social media where like, you had to tell people your problems in real time and in person. 
But we had made a determination when we'd gotten back together and the way we were serving the Lord is that we were never gonna hide our pain. We're gonna be real with people. We're gonna go and we're gonna put it out there, whatever we're going through. And we need, we need to be surrendered. And so we went to church that Sunday and we sat in the section that we normally do. We kind of came in late. And during the worship time, we're sobbing and we're just lifting our hands in surrender. It was so hard to do. And we're worshiping him. And then one of the coolest things that I've ever experienced in my life was that people who knew us, that we were in community with, we were in a small group with, that they got up from where they were at and moved and like climbed over seats and started like hugging us and huddling with us and crying with us and weeping with us and praying for us. And even the worship pastor's wife who was playing the keys, she like just left the band mid-song and walked down and started praying with us. And that meant so much to be broken and surrendered and have people surround us and pray for us. And here's the thing, we didn't, the miracle wasn't that we left church that day with a baby in our arms. But we left church that day with hope in our hearts. And as a couple, it was surrendered to God no matter what. And that was that next week that we were invited to an adoption orientation. Had we not gone to church that Sunday and responded to Jesus, our hearts wouldn't have been soft enough to go to that orientation. In fact, I don't think our marriage would have survived it. I know I wouldn't have stayed sober. I know that nothing in our life would be what it is today if we hadn't been surrendered to Jesus in that moment. He takes a seed of surrender and he brings about a harvest of redemption. And I want to pray that for you today. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, physical, mental, emotional, financial, relational, where you're saying, what good could come of this? But I trust you, God. I surrender to you. It takes courage to do that. It takes ultimate trust. You're saying, your ways are greater than mine. I give this to you, God. Redeem my life. Redeem what I'm going through and turn it for your glory, for my good. I want to pray that for you, if that applies to you. And I wanted to ask you to do something courageous. With everyone's eyes open and everyone look, looking around at all the campuses, I'm going to ask you that at this moment right now, if you want to be included in that prayer, that you would stand up. It's right where you're at. Thank you. Thank you. You'll never forget this moment. It'll be a marking moment in your life that God will use for the rest of your life because he's going to change something right now. Just in the spiritual atmosphere that we're in right now, I believe with all my heart he's going to change them. He's going to break chains. He's going to give victory. He's going to fill your hearts with hope. I, I, I think about what the Apostle Paul said when he was praying for the thorn in his flesh to be removed three times. We don't know what that was. You can apply it to whatever it is you're going through. He prayed for that, and Jesus himself spoke to him and said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is enough for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. Whatever it is that you stood for, whatever weakness that is, whatever brokenness that is, by your surrender and your trust in God and confidence in his word, his power is made perfect in that situation in your life right now. And we can say, when I'm weak, I am strong. I want to do one other thing. If anyone who's seated, if you can look around, I know there's a lot of people standing, you might need to do this for each other. But if you can get up from where you're at and just put a hand on someone's shoulder, if you're standing, the person next to you standing, just put a hand on each other's shoulder. I don't want anyone to be standing alone. Let's pray for one another right now. There's something beautiful that happens when the body of Christ comes together to pray for one another. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. And God, we turn to you right now. And God, we call upon your Holy Spirit to move in this place right now. God, that you would touch our lives. God, each person that stood and showed courage and showed a trust in you, that believing that you're good, that you're powerful, that you will meet their needs, that you'll break through the darkness right now. In the name of Jesus, we bind the work of the enemy. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we proclaim freedom. God, that people would be filled with hope and healing and a trust in you and new life in you. We pray this all in Jesus' amazing name. Amen.